So just want to say welcome to the first uh, BISA event. Um, firstly, thank you to all of you for signing up and also thank you to Dr. Aaron Kiro um, for agreeing to do the session. Um, so for those of you who don't know Aaron, um, Dr. Aaron Kiro, uh, he is an SD1 Opthal trainee at the Royal Free. Um, he's gonna be going over high yield concepts in Opthal that are coming come up in written um, practical uh, clinical exams and the Duke Elder exam as well, which is coming up in March. Um, this event should be a good opportunity for you to brush up on your knowledge of Opthal um, and who better uh, to learn from than uh, Dr. Kira, who's ranked third nationally in the Opthal National Recruitment um, after graduating from Cambridge in 2017. So uh, off to you, Dr. Kira. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I can hear you. Thanks, All right, thanks guys. Thanks for joining in. Um, and uh, one to all these three. Sid, Sonam and Amar for managing to get this all organize us together and get so many people coming. So I'm Aaron. Um, uh, I've actually upgraded since I gave Sid that bio. So I've, I've upgraded to an SD2 now, um, just the standard moving up a year, nothing special. And today's we're basically gonna be lots of ophthalmology cases um, that hopefully will help you for your finals. Um, uh, for those of you sitting finals very shortly. Can I just get an idea in the chat who I'm speaking to? I always just like to do this at the start. Are you like first year, second year, fifth year, final year? Um, just so I know kind of what level most people are. Okay. Uh, whoa, whoa. Uh, okay, so mostly final years, uh, a few, like not, not many below third year. Okay, cool. Starting up down this week. Okay, fine. Awesome. I recognize some names as well, which is nice. Okay, fine. So thanks for having me as well. Um, you guys and hopefully you guys find this useful cool you guys can see this right yeah yeah perfect okay so before we go into like full-blown cases um i think whenever you revise any subject and this is not just ophthalmology this is kind of gastro cardiology neuro it's just nice to spend like 10 15 minutes literally just on google um googling the anatomy so you just remind yourself like what the flip is going on because like with the eyes especially, like you don't learn about it otherwise. So I think it's just nice before I go any further to just say a little bit about the anatomy so things start to make sense. Um, so this is a cross section of the eye. Um, let's focus on this picture. Um, this clear window is called the cornea. Um, here you can see the white thick part, which we will see as the white part there is the sclera. Above that is a very translucent layer called the conjunctiva. So when people say, oh, I've got a red eye, I've got a conjunctivitis, it's not actually the white part of the eye that's going red. It's the clear conjunctiva that's becoming inflamed and therefore the white part looks red because this is normally clear and therefore if it's red on top, the white part looks red. So you've got the cornea. Um, there's no conch here. So the cornea becomes basically the sclera here at the edges um, of this part. And then you've got that clear transparent layer called the conjunctiva. And then behind the cornea, you've got this space. And this is called the anterior chamber. Basically anything from the back of the cornea up to this iris, which is in this color, this person has a green eyes. So anything between the iris and the back of the cornea is called the anterior chamber. And anything kind of behind the iris is called the posterior chamber. So this anterior chamber, this is our pupil, which is basically the gap between our iris. And that changes based on light and accommodation in terms of size. And then we've got the posterior chamber. Um, we've got the lens here. The lens is suspended by ropes or what we call zonules, which you don't really know too much about. Um, and zonules are connected to the ciliary body, which is important in glaucoma because that makes our aqueous humor. So the ciliary body over here makes kind of the aqueous. You can think of the front part of the eye as kind of like a sink mechanism. So the ciliary body is the tap, it switches on and it makes kind of this thing called aqueous humor, which is the water coming from the sink. The aqueous kind of circulates here through this hole, which is a pupil and an anterior chamber. It gives oxygen, glucose things to all these structures. Um, uh, does lots of other things as well. And then it drains through basically, it's not labeled here, but something called the trabecular meshwork, which is our drain. Um, and that's all important in glaucoma. And then behind the lens, and we all have this natural lens, which we're born within the eye, um, it gets cloudy over time and that's called a cataract, is a big ball of jelly, which is called the vitreous, which actually absolutely does nothing, it has no use as an adult, it's important to know that, um, 
even though it contain, it's a big part of the eye. It's important when we're in utero because it's the kind of pathway which blood vessels go through the vitreous to give kind of blood to these parts of the eye. But once you're born, it does nothing. Um, and then you've got the retina, which is all of this bit here. And the retina converts all the light to electricity. And then it goes down the optic nerve and towards the back of the brain where it basically lets you see. So that's a kind of rundown of the front to the back of the eye. Um, and the retina, which we talked about, is this kind of picture here, which we've probably seen in photographs and on MCQ questions and past med. And all of this is retina. This kind of a flat version of what we have here. Um, so all of this is retina. On top of the retina, you have, you can see the circle, which is your nerve. So you kind of see the end of the nerve called the optic nerve head. So remember when people talk about papilledema and things like that, this optic nerve head is just the end of this nerve. So you're kind of seeing a pipe and you're only seeing the end of it. So when people say, oh, it looks swollen, it's quite cool, I think, because this is kind of part of the brain. The optic nerve becomes optic tracts, which goes into the brain. So to visualize a brain, apart from CT scans, MRI scans, you can actually visualize it by looking at the retina. Um, so that's kind of looking at part of the brain. And then you've got all these blood vessels, um, which are arteries and veins. And then the center part, which is the most important part for vision, 90% of the vision is basically occurring here at our macula and the center of that is called the fovea. And all of this is only responsible for about 10% of our vision. So this is really, really important for vision. Cool, okay, hopefully that was a quick summary, a quick reminder for anyone who hasn't looked over that for a while. Fine, I think the most useful way to do this is to just do loads of cases and basically be as interactive as possible. If you have questions then feel free to basically put it in the chat and I'll try and do them along the way or we can finish and I'm happy to do them at the end. Um, so, Fine, let's have a look at this. We've got a four-year-old boy is brought to A&E with redness and swelling of his right eyelid. That should say left, sorry, the picture says left. Let's assume this is the right eyelid on the picture. So four-year-old boy is brought to A&E with redness and swelling of his right eyelid. He says he's been having recent flu-like symptoms for the last four days. So um, that's your vignette. I'm not saying this patient has orbital cellulitis, but that's a definitely a potential. So which of the following features would be most concerning for orbital cellulitis? This is kind of like how your final MCQs may be. Um, and it's going further than just what is the diagnosis, it's kind of how do you work from that? So I'm gonna try and pull up a poll function. Um, okay, so we haven't actually got the question on the poll, but hopefully you guys can answer that. Um, so this is the question, A, B, C, D, E, which of the following features would be most concerning for orbital cellulitis, most concerning for orbital cellulitis. A, visual acuity is reduced. B, full range of eye movements. C, a right-sided RAPD. D, conjunctival injection, which is a red eye. And E, normal visual fields. I give you about 45 seconds to answer each question. So put down an answer. I think it's really important to just get in the habit of putting down an answer. And we'll stop there. Okay, so we've got two answers that were quite predominant. We've got A, over half, just over half you went for A, reduced visual acuity. I can see why. Um, the rest of you mainly went for C and then a few of you went for B, D or E. So the correct answer here is C, a right-sided RAPD. Um, and we'll talk about why. Um, basically, A, visual acuity reduced is absolutely a concerning feature, but it's very global, it's very vague. That's why I put this question in. It is a potential sign of kind of damage to the eye but it's not very specific for orbital cellulitis. B, full range of eye movements is completely normal, so that wouldn't be concerning. C, a right-sided RAPD. We'll talk about what an RAPD is. It stands for Relative Afferent Pupillary Defect, and you can basically summarize as one of two problems wrong when you have an RAPD. Number one is a problem with the optic nerve, which we've talked about already. Number two, there's a massive problem with the retina. So usually, there's a problem with the optic nerve. Um, so that would make sense potentially for orbital cellulitis. If you've got lots of cellulitis in the orbit and it's affecting the optic nerve, that would be very bad um, because that would mean that the optic nerve is affected. Deconjunctival injection just means a red eye. Once again, it's very vague. Conjunctivitis can cause that. Um, a uveitis can cause that. An eyelash in the eye can cause that. So it's not concerning particularly for orbital cellulitis and E, normal visual fluids is like it says, normal. So that wouldn't be concerning. So the correct answer here is C, right side of RAPD. What I'd like to do now is go over this case completely. So, I've um, got a few questions. Uh, what's RAPD there? Oh, perfect, someone's answered it. So, with orbital cellulitis, what 
you need to also be aware of is kind of the much less severe version, which is a periorbital cellulitis. The reason I put this in red is because questions, MCQs, clinicians, ophthalmologists, medics, we use lots of terms interchangeably. So orbital cellulitis is also called, and the correct anatomical term is a post-septal cellulitis. Post means after, like um, post your exams or whatever. Uh, septal is septum, like you have a septum in the heart, you have a uh, atrial septal defect, a hole in the walls between the atria. Um, so behind the septum, cellulitis is inflammation. Oh, let me cross that over. Um, this is an emergency. So this is very, very kind of serious. Periorbital cellulitis, which is very, very kind of used interchangeably, but it's completely different, is kind of preceptal. So all the inflammation is in front, pre, of your orbital septum. We'll talk about kind of where that septum is. And this only affects the eyelids, okay? So this only affects the eyelids. This is when the infection has spread past the orbital septum, which is in the eyelids, and it affects not only the eyelids, but actually the eyeball and potentially what's behind the eyeball, which is the orbit. Okay, so let's go into this properly. So orbital cellulitis, what do the words actually mean? Itis is inflammation, cellulitis is inflammation of the cells. So that's kind of an inflammation of the cells. Um, but this is particularly an infection. So an infection that spreads past the orbital septum, which we've already mentioned. This is a cross section of the eye. So this is the eyeball here. We've just talked about the optic nerve. We talked about the vitreous, the jelly, the lens, and then the cornea, which is the front part of the eye. This in blue, which I've highlighted, is your eyelids, okay? This is your eyelids. Um, actually, no, that's wrong. This is your eyelids, sorry. This is all your eyelids here. The blue part is the orbital septum. So that's a thick fibrous membrane within our eyelids. If you feel your eyelids now, they're not completely soft like different parts of your skin. There's a bit of kind of strength and tensility there. Um, and that is due to the orbital septum. It's like a septum wall and it has a very important role. It's basically there as a protective mechanism. It provides a thick barrier. So orbital cellulitis is when the infection goes past this thick membrane. Um, obviously the infection needs to start from somewhere. So what are kind of the pathogenesis behind this? You could be an infection that starts somewhere in front of it. So a sinusitis, so inflammation in the sinuses. That's why this particular question said, this boy has been having recent flu-like symptoms for the last four days. It's trying to indicate that there's a source of infection there where the infection may have started. A dacrocystitis, which is inflammation of the lacrimal gland, um, sorry, the lacrimal, yeah, the lacrimal sac actually, which sits kind of just um, kind of where the nose is. It kind of drains the tears through the punctum into the lacrimal sac. And a hordeolum is like a sty or a clasin that sits on the eyelid, like an eyelid bump. Some pus there can start there and it can spread backwards past the orbital septum. It could be due to trauma. Obviously, if you've got trauma, then you've usually got a break in the skin, so that's a source of infection. And if you're immunocompromised, it can always come hematogenously. Okay, risk factors for orbital cellulitis. The kind of questions where orbital cellulitis will be a big thing you need to think about is in children. And the reason why is that orbital septum is very, very fragile when you're young and it only fully develops around the age of seven or eight. So until then, anyone who has any infection in the sinuses or in the lacrimal sac or a little in skin infection that we would not worry about is at high risk of orbital cellulitis because there's that, they, they don't have that thick membrane to protect them. So if you see a young child in your question, like here, four-year-old, you need to worry about orbital cellulitis. Organisms are really easy to remember. So staphs and streps, they live on the skin. Sorry, oops, that was me. Um, um, okay, carry on. Preceptal cellulitis, like I said, this is only affecting the eyelids and it's all pre in front of the septum. So you still get a red, you still get this kind of picture an induration is kind of a rough skin, roughing of the skin. It'll be warm, it'll be red, it'll be slightly painful. They might not be able to open the eye because of the pain, but that's all. The further features to suggest an orbital cellulitis will be more systemic things. So a fever, proptosis. So if the infection has spread past that orbital septum, it could be sitting just past the orbital septum. It could be within the eyeball. It could be even behind the eyeball. So if it's behind the eyeball, it might push the eyeball forward and cause what we call proptosis, which is a pushed forward eyeball. Just a random question. Does anyone know another word for proptosis that sometimes examiners like? It's, that means exactly the same thing. Yeah, perfect. Exophthalmos means exactly the same as proptosis. Enophthalmos is when the eye is sunken in, so the opposite. And then chemosis is just where you've got in, um, kind of a swollen conge. So you know that clear window, that, not the clear window at the front, the conge, which is the clear layer that kind of sits over the sclera. When that becomes inflamed in yellow, that's called chemosis. 
Okay, fine. So you can see already that chemosis affects the eye, so it can't be preceptal, because remember, that's only the eyelids. Proptosis is pushing the eyeball forward. It can't be a preceptal. Fever is very systemic, so once again, it's more of a sign of orbital. This is really important. The, this particular box, imaginary box I'm drawing out now with my cursor, the red flag signs of optic nerve compromise. These five signs are a sign that the optic nerve has been affected, and that doesn't necessarily only mean orbital cellulitis. It could be other things with the optic nerve, like an optic neuritis or a traumatic optic neuropathy. We've got trauma that affects the optic nerve. And these are kind of the five functions of the optic nerve. And examiners really like to put this in question. So reduced vision, reduced color vision, an RAPD, a relative afferent pupillary defect, where you shine the light and swing it from eye to eye. A normal response would be both eyes constrict, both eyes constrict, both eyes constrict. If it goes with both eyes constrict and then both eyes dilate, that means it's an RAPD. That's a positive sign um, of an RAPD. Reduced visual fields um, and ophthalmoplegia. So if you've got a really inflamed optic nerve, as you kind of move your eyeball from side to side, the inflamed optic nerve gets irritated. So you get pain on eye movement. So looking back to our question that we had, the correct answer here was all right RAPD. You still can't say visual acuity is not a sign, but a more concerning feature would be a right RAPD because that shows the optic nerve is damaged. Um, reduced vision can mean lots of things, like I said, not just optic nerve compromise. That's why the correct answer here would be an RAPD. Okay, let's carry on. Um, so you think orbital cellulitis, what do you do next? You're not sure between preceptor or orbital. Whenever, you, whenever you've got a child, if you don't want to scan them, but sometimes you might have to. Um, so you'd start with kind of, um, less invasive things like blood, so FBC, CRP, ESR to look for raised inflammatory markers, blood cultures, is there kind of an organism in the blood as well? And if you need to, you do a scanning, so something like a CT head. CT head is the one that you do for an orbital cellulitis. And just looking at this picture, you can see comparing this side to this side, all these muscles are inflamed. You can see there's lots of soft tissue swelling here. And this is all signs that the infection isn't just here at the eyelids, it's all kind of posterior to the orbital septum. Um, how would you manage this patient? A child with orbital cellulitis, you kind of have to admit them because they need strong antibiotics, not just topical antibiotics, they need IV antibiotics. So through the vein, usually for the first 72 hours, they get better very quickly, then they can get go home and have oral antibiotics through a syrup, or if they can have tablets, they have tablets. Um, ENT are normally usually involved as well, because like I said, the source is usually from a sinus or something like that. And if they've got sinus problems and the IV antibiotics just aren't doing the trick, you might need to drain the sinus infection first and then this would all settle. Um, and if they're not getting better, you need to repeat the CT because just because you're past the septum, there could be lots of stages that. So this is normal. You can see here, this is a massive cellulitis. This is an isolated orbital abscess and this is kind of extend beyond into kind of the cavern of sinus. So there's lots of different forms of orbital cellulitis. Um, and if you've got a preceptor, then it's much, much simpler, warm compresses for the eyelid, and you can give them oral or topical antibiotics, but nothing IV. Okay, so that's orbital cellulitis, um, and kind of its little baby brother preceptor, which you don't need to worry about too much. The big kind of take home point here is these red flag signs of optic nerve compromise, which are relevant not just here, but with any optic nerve problem. Okay, um, any questions? Can't see anything, great. Okay, let's have a look at the next case. So, case number two, a 14 year old boy is brought into the emergency department after suffering a high impact injury when a football hits his right eye. He had no loss of consciousness, not consciousness, but is complaining of right facial pain, okay? So, have a look at this question. I'll bring the poll up again. In an orbital blowout fracture, which bone is most likely to be involved? In an orbital blowout fracture, which bone is most likely to be involved? You've got A, maxillary bone, B, zygomatic bone, C, frontal bone, D, sphenoid bone, and E, palatine bone. Okay, I'll give you another 10 seconds or so. Okay, so stop there. So what we've we got here, we've got most of you going for the zygomatic bone, closely followed by the maxillary bone, 
and a few for the frontal sphenoid or palatine bone. Okay, so the correct answer is you kind of almost know what you don't is the maxillary bone, but we'll talk about zygomatic can be involved, but most likely it's the maxillary bone. Okay, so um, where are we? Sorry. So this is what a blowout fracture is. A blowout fracture is basically a break in any of the bones that surrounds the eye. That's what the technical definition of a blowout fracture is. And why does it happen? So you've got a kind of blunt injury where you've got a ball usually, or someone's been punched in the eye. Um, had a case today in AE where someone got punched in the eye last night. It happens. Um, strikes the eye. The force of that blunt trauma, when I say blunt, it means it hasn't kind of pierced the skin. It hasn't kind of perforated anything basically causes the, the force kind of shock waves transmit. And the way the orbit works is you'd pr rather protect the eye and um, kind of the damage goes towards the bones. And that's how the eye is kind of made um, evolutionary, I guess. So the force is transmitted into the orbit. And as kind of forces suggest, the thinnest orbital bones are the first to fracture. Okay, the thinnest bones fracture first. And the reason this force protects the eye from more serious injury. Okay, so the most common fracture sites, this is another question that can come up. Where are the most common fracture sites? It's the orbital floor and the medial wall. So the floor here and the medial wall next to the nose. Okay, so that's the first kind of semi kind of first question they could ask. Then they could also ask kind of the bones. And as you can see here, um, maxillary bone is this one over here. So it involves both the orbital floor and the medial wall and zygomatic, which can also be involved is more the lateral side and the floor as well. But as you can see, mainly the floor is the maxillary bone. Okay, what do you see in a patient with a blood fracture? First of all, they've got trauma. So you're gonna see the signs of trauma. You're gonna see the eyelid swelling. They're gonna be in pain. They may have reduced vision because all the soft tissues are swollen. Um, they could have diplopia. Any ideas why they might have diplopia? Double vision, why might they have double vision? Anyone got any idea? Yeah, exactly. So um, sometimes the muscles themselves can become trapped in a fracture. So the muscles that control the eyeball, if you get a fracture, say of the orbital, uh, orbital floor, the inferior rectus muscle sometimes gets trapped in that fracture. So it just doesn't work as well. So usually the muscles work together. So if you want to look down, both my eyes look down. If this one's working fine, but this one isn't working, my eyes aren't going to be like, aligned. So you get double vision. Surgical emphysema, which is kind of where you see the kind of gas bubbles and you hear them click. Enophthalmus, which is where that we talked about the eyeball is sunken in. But you can also get the opposite, which is proptosis. And that's if you've got a bleed, so you've got massive trauma, you've got blood collecting behind the eye, pushing the eye forward. And you get hyperesthesia. That's where you get kind of reduced sensation below the lower lid. And why is that common? Because the infraorbital nerve runs in this little hole here. So if you've got a fracture here, that nerve can be damaged and it just doesn't do its job, so you can't feel as well kind of just below the eyelid. Okay, so investigations. Um, you've got to do imaging here. You've got to start with an X-ray and potentially a CT. And this is a great picture here because it shows how thin that orbital floor is and how thin the medial wall is. But usually it's a floor that goes first and then the medial wall. Um, and you can see here, there's a fracture here and you've got loads of fats, loads of muscle contents that just kind of herniated through this gap. And this is a great example where you get diplopia. Here you can see this is where the inferior rectus muscle normally is. Here, the muscle is somewhere down here. How would you manage this? So first of all, A, B, C, D, E, this is a multi-trauma patient. So they need to have their workup. They've probably got kind of some sort of infection spread because they're into the sinus down here. So you've got to cover them with antibiotics. Avoid blowing the nose because the more you blow your nose, the more forces are gonna push everything down. And obviously refer to ophthalmology and max fax in this case. Okay, so that's kind of a common case that can come up. The main question is kind of which are the areas that are most affected? So that'd be the floor or the medial wall and the bone that covers both is the maxillary bone. Could the sinuses connect directly to the orbit? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the maxillary sinus. We've talked about the maxillary bone over here. This is the maxillary sinus and absolutely there's a connection between the sinus and the orbit here. So if you've got like loads of pus down here from a sinusitis, that is not very good at all. Cool. Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, not too bad. So next case. Um, got a 36-year-old woman presents to a GP with a red right eye for four days. She describes pain on bright lights and watering of the eye. She is a contact lens wearer. Okay. 
So the vision is 612 in the right eye. What this means, so anyone who's not familiar is 66, it's basically 2020 vision. 66 means you can see perfectly well. Um, uh, anything which is 69 or 612 or 615 or 660 or 600 is worse vision. Um, sometimes you'll see 64, which means you've got better vision than what is graded as 2020. So her vision is slightly reduced in the right eye. The conjunctiva appears injected. All that means is this kind of redness. So you can see you've still got the white below that's absolutely there, but all this is red. The red, the white part has actually got red. It's that clear layer in front, the conjunctiva, which is kind of injected. And that's what that's a technical term in conjunctival injection. That is what a red eye officially is. The cornea, which is this clear window here we've talked about, it can appear slightly hazy. There's the white collection seen over here inferiorly. We'll talk about what that is. And the pupils are working equal and reactive to light. Okay. So red right eye, four days, pain on bright lights, watering of the eye, she's a contact lens wearer. So here's our question. What is the most likely diagnosis? What is the most likely diagnosis? I'm gonna bring up a poll and have a go at what you think this could be. But A, acute angle closure glaucoma, B, bacterial keratitis, C, viral keratitis, D, anterior uveitis, and E, endophthalmitis. <clears throat> okay, about five seconds left. And stop there. Okay, so most of you have gone for bacterial keratitis. About half of you, just under half of that group, have gone for anterior uveitis and a few for acute angle closure, viral keratitis, endothelitis. You guys are pretty good. So that is the correct answer, bacterial keratitis. I absolutely understand why a lot of you have put anterior uveitis and that was a trap answer here. Just to summarize, when you see a question like this, you have to be aware of they're a contact lens wearer. As soon as someone says in the question or even in real life, they're a contact lens wearer, you are automatically 90% going towards a bacterial keratitis. And I wear contacts myself. Um, I don't know how seeing, after seeing so many people with contact lens problems, but if someone's put contact lens wearer and they put that in the question, then they're almost trying to give you the answer. It's almost certainly a bacterial keratitis if they have all the other signs that we've talked about here, which is a red eye, reduced vision, hypopion, which is what this is, a cloudy cornea, pain, things like that, okay? Um, the reason is contact lens sitting on the eye for 12 hours a day is so easy to take bacteria on there. Bacteria from your finger goes on the eye, stays on the eye there, the contact lens doesn't move for 12 hours, sticks to the cornea. Yeah. Um, the one that I need to, oh, someone's unmuted. I'll let wait for that. Um, anterior uveitis is absolutely something important to consider. And the thing that makes you think anterior uveitis is probably pain on bright lights, which we call photophobia. That is a classic sign of anterior uveitis. Um, but the fact that this person is a contact lens wearer makes it so much more likely that this bacterial keratitis is the other reason why you're thinking more likely uh, bacterial keratitis, they've got hypopian. Hypopian usually means an infective thing because this is all white blood cells and pus. Uh, bacterial keratitis is clearly infectious. It's got the word bacterial in. Whereas a uveitis is just inflammation. Itis means inflammation. It's inflammation of the anterior uvea, which is the iris. So if it didn't say contact lens wearer and everything else was the same, except there was no hypopian and there was no contact lens wearer, the answer would be anterior uveitis. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, that's my grandma. Um, so yeah, uh, this is definitely bacterial keratitis. Okay, so let's have a look. Um, what is a bacterial keratitis? Uh, what is the white collection? Hypopium, we've talked about it. Um, so keratitis, itis means inflammation. Kera means of the cornea. So inflammation of the cornea. Usually, almost certainly, this is infective. So you can get bacterial, viral, or fungal. We'll talk about all of these, but the main one with contact lens wear is bacterial keratitis. Um, risk factors, the big one is contact lenses because you're putting something foreign onto your eye. We all do it, I do it myself, but it is a big risk factor. What are the other risk factors? Just to be aware, kind of understanding wise, this won't really come in questions, but if you've got a break in the cornea, for example, from trauma, you're more at risk of a bacteria getting in and causing infection. If you've got a dry eye, so our eyes are all protected by tear film. Um, if that tear film is reduced, there's less protection. If you're using prolonged steroid drops, that's steroid drops and uh, usually used to treat 
some things um, I can be used for kind of conjunctivitis, kind of symptomatic relief. If they use that for a long time, obviously steroid drops are anti-inflammatory, which means they kind of take away the protective mechanism and therefore they're more likely for bugs to grow. But the big one is contact lens wear. Okay, so this is important. What is the most common bug in contact lens wear for bacterial keratitis is a pseudomonas. That's what we really worry about. A pseudomonas is the big kind of MCQ answer if, you, if they say, what is the most common bug? And this is what a kind of nasty ulcer looks like. You'll be able to see. So the white stuff is basically the actual pus and like um, actual the bug causing a scar on the front of the cornea. You would see a hypopian would be right at the bottom. And we'll talk about the hypopian in a bit, but this is the, the actual infection. Um, and this is where you get the bugs from. So pseudomonas is the most common. Features are quite kind of like vague, apart from the ones I've put in red. So painful eyes, a bit vague. Red eyes, a bit vague. Blurred vision is a bit vague. vague. Purulent discharge. So if you see, if this question says green purulent discharge, you're thinking bacteria. Um, if you see a hypopion, which is this collection of white blood cells, which I had a picture of somewhere, where is it? Um, I guess we're just, this, this kind of collection. The reason why this is always at the bottom with a nice horizontal line is, remember right to the back, we have the anterior chamber, which is everything in front of the iris. All the parts, all the white blood cells is very heavy. So it sinks to the bottom. Um, so you get this kind of collection. It's literally fluid that's kind of dropped because of gravity to the bottom. Okay, so then hypopian is a collection of white blood cells. Um, and then the white corneal opacity, which is a, the actual corneal ulcer, that, that won't always be there. That won't, because you usually catch them before you get that. Okay, so um, how would you investigate this patient? First thing is stain with fluorescein. So you basically put some uh, orange fluorescein dye and you look with a cobalt blue light and you'll see this green appearance. And this is kind of like um, uh, bare epithelium. So this is where basically, you know this is where the infection is because bugs kind of eating here. And um, it's almost like, think of a pothole in the road. Um, if you throw um, a bucket of paint, the paint will go sit in that kind of pothole. That's kind of what this is, is because um, that's what you see, bare epithelium. How do you kind of, once you think you've got an ulcer, uh, how do you kind of find out what bug it is? You do a corneal scrape. So basically you get a needle, you put lots of anesthetic, you get a needle and you try and get some of the slough and then send it off on plates and kind of slides to the lab. And then it grows back to bacteria and the sensitivities. Okay, straight away, how do you stop the, stop the contact lens where you don't want contact lens on top of all of this bare epithelium and lots of antibiotic drops. The infection is there. People think why not oral antibiotics, but the infection is in the eye, on the surface of the eye, because you want the drops working directly on there. And we usually give ciprofloxacin or moxifloxacin or ofloxacin or the fluoroquinolone. So that's how we treat that. Um, cool. So that's bacterial keratitis. The big kind of giveaway is the round ulcer appearance, the round ulcer, you're thinking bacterial keratitis or with a contact lens wear. Um, how can you distinguish between anterior uvertus, endophthalmitis and keratitis if you don't have risk factors? Um, that is really common. That's really, that's really good question. And actually it's really difficult. Um, almost all of that is in the history with the risk factors. So an anterior uvertus is, we'll talk about that right at the end, is just inflammation. So you wouldn't necessarily see the signs of like, infection like discharge or hypopian. Endophthalmitis is almost always after an intervention, so surgery or uh, an, an intravitreal injection in the eye. And a keratitis like this is usually contact lens wear. There's another risk factor for um, keratitis and that's for viral keratitis. And that's what we're gonna talk about now. And the big one here is herpes virus. So you'd always, not always, but the MCQs would have this history of cold sores. So if it says cold sores, you're thinking, this is a keratitis, but more likely a viral keratitis caused by HSV1 or HSV2. Once again, all these signs at the top are very vague. So reduced pain, reduced vision, pain, photophobia, red eye. They're all very vague. They're not specific signs. But for viral, you want to think watery discharge. So like a viral conjunctivitis, that causes a more watery discharge. A viral keratitis, same kind of thing, was a watery discharge compared to a purulent, thick, green discharge for bacteria. The risk factors, like I said, are cold sores because that's a sign you've got the HSV virus kind of dormant in your body. And this time, rather than a round ulcer, which we talked about, you've put the fluorescein dye in and you get this kind of branching pattern, which is called a dendritic ulcer. And that's the giveaway. If you see dendritic in your MCQs, 
you know it's a viral keratitis, it's a herpes simplex keratitis, and you treat it with viral drops, acyclovir drops. So just watch out, if they talk about fluorescein, watch out for the name, the, the, the cold source coming up, or if they talk about the shape, and th that would be kind of signs that you think much more likely viral. Um, is it common to get this bilateral? I'm assuming that's the bacterial keratitis. Yeah, you can get bacterial keratitis, um, but usually it comes from one contact lens. So whichever eye kind of you put the contact lens in, obviously if you've got really bad eyes, I don't know if you've like, you've got really bad hand hygiene, if you're like in the mud or something, and then you put your contact lens in, you're probably gonna get it in both. So don't do that. Cool. Can hypopium be seen anterior versus well? It can, it can. Um, we'll come on to that, right? It's very, very, it can do, yeah, it can be. Um, okay, next case, how are we doing for time? Are you guys okay with the pace or do you want to go a little bit faster, a little bit slower? Um, just let me know in the chat. I've got three more cases to go. Um, okay, most people are happy. Cool, okay, fine. So next case, 69-year-old um, woman presents with severe headaches, blurred vision, red, painful left eye, and she's vomited twice. Okay, the left pupil is dilated and oval in shape, and I added it's not responding to light or anything like that. The cornea is hazy. Okay, 69, headaches, blurred vision, red painful eye, twice vomited, pupils dilated, oval in shape. Without me even going to the MCQ, what do you guys think is the most likely diagnosis? Put it in the chat. Yeah. Uh, good. I like the fact that some of you have put more than one in. Yeah. So acute angle closure glaucoma is absolutely right. Temporal arthritis, also GCA, could definitely be something you want to think about, especially with the age. Temporal arthritis or giant cell arthritis, you're thinking pain on the scalp um, or temporal pain, scalp tenderness, jaw cordication. Um, but you're absolutely right. Angle closure glaucoma, acute angle closure glaucoma is the answer here. So what is the most likely diagnosis? Acute angle closure glaucoma, great. So glaucoma, um, one of my favorite topics in ophthalmology. So what is glaucoma? Um, it's basically three things that talk, three big things in glaucoma, optic nerve damage, visual field defect, and maybe raised intraocular pressure. And I'll talk about why that is. So optic nerve damage due to raised intraocular pressure is the kind of medical school definition of glaucoma. That's not 100% true, but we'll go with that. Usually there's three things in glaucoma, optic nerve damage, visual field loss or visual field being affected, and sometimes raised intraocular pressure. But when they say that, they mean high pressure for that person, just like blood pressure for people who are fit and well, slightly high blood pressure could be higher than normal, whereas on our high blood pressure could be very low for someone else who's used to like 170 over 100. Okay. Broadly, there's two main types of glaucoma, open angle glaucoma and closed angle glaucoma. And before we kind of go into the subtypes, we'll talk about kind of the pathway. And we mentioned this briefly at the start. So the normal aqueous pathway is that kind of sink mechanism I talked about earlier. So the aqueous is made here in the orange bit by the ciliary body. Um, and it's secreted into the posterior chamber. The aqueous kind of circulates in the posterior chamber and passes through the pupil. So this is the iris, half of the iris over here secreted through the, passes through the pupil into the anterior chamber, which is anything in front of the iris and behind the cornea. And then most of it kind of circulates here, gives some oxygen, glucose and things like that, drains by the trabecular meshwork, um, which is these kind of holes over here, you can see on the edge, and then into kind of the bloodstream, very small portion goes through some other pathway called the uvia scleral pathway, you don't need to know about that. Okay, so acute angle closure glaucoma, the almost 99% of cases is due to something called pupil block mechanism. So basically the best way to describe it is the people that get acute angle closure glaucoma, people will say, oh my God, this sounds really scary. So basically acute angle closure glaucoma, before we go into the slide, um, just kind of watch my video for a second. This will make a lot more sense. Um, let me just make sure I can't even see the video. Uh, right, right, right. Okay. So, Think of the fact that normal people who don't have glaucoma or whatever have a drainage hole kind of like this space. You can see that. So most of us, like myself and most of you, have a drainage channel or the trabecular mesh that we just talked about that drains through this big hole. 
some people are born with small ears, therefore some people are also born with like, small drainage angles. So they are basically like this 90% of the time. So they're already quite small. It still works, the sink still works 90% of the time, but sometimes it gets a little bit blocked and then it unblocks itself. That's the mechanism behind who gets acute angle closure glaucoma. Not everyone gets acute angle closure glaucoma. You need to have the risk factors. And that's what these risk factors are. Usually it's females, usually it's people with small eyes. You can imagine if you've got a big eye, like me, I'm very myopic, so I'm short-sighted. I need minus six kind of contact lenses to see in the distance. That's a big eye. And a big eye generally has a big drainage angle, whereas small eyes have a very small drainage angle. Asian ethnicity, especially kind of oriental people, and age. So as you get older, you're more likely to get this problem. Okay, so what actually happens, remember, these people already start like this. So when their pupil dilates, that is the big thing that could come up in your MCQ, which is a giveaway. So when the pupil dilates, remember, the pupil, which is that hole, which is controlled by the iris over here, dilates in dark conditions and constricts in light conditions. It also constricts with things like accommodation when you focus on a near target. So in response to dark conditions, and in your MCQ, it'll probably be like in the cinema or very late at night at 10 p.m. Um, when pupil dilates, you can imagine that these iris bits get, get pulled outwards. And what happens is this drainage angle, which is already like this, you can see here, when, when this pulls up, the peripheral iris, peripheral iris, so this bit here, bunches up. So rather than being all flat, it kind of kind of bunches up. That's all, that's all the word. It kind of gets squashed up. And you can see that already it's kind of squeezing up to the point where this angle is starting to get even more narrow. So if you start like this, it's suddenly kind of getting even, even more narrow. What happens then is because of all this bunching, the shape of the iris kind of changes and you start to get kind of some of the aqueous not going through as fast. And it starts to build up, build up, build up, build up, build up. And then, you know, maybe most of the time your pupil starts to kind of go back to its normal size when you say, I don't know, go outside. And then that, that whole mechanism gets kind of released. But say it's there for a long time and say it stays bunched up for a long time to the point where you've got lots of aqueous slowly building up, slowly building up. It starts to build up over here. It's gonna push this iris even more forward. So build up of aqueous in the posterior chamber, pushes this peripheral iris forward even more. And at one point, you've got an angle that started like this, which went like this, which went like this, which went like this. And then at one point, it just completely shuts. And that is when you get acute angle closure glaucoma. And that's what I wanted to kind of really emphasize. People don't just get acute angle closure glaucoma by sitting in the dark. You need to have the risk factors. I hope that makes some sense. So usually it's a female, like it was in this question. Usually they're quite elderly or doesn't have to be, but usually. Um, and if they mention small eyes or hypermetropic, then that's also a big clue, kind of, this could be an angle closure case. Okay, that was just kind of some understanding, so hopefully it makes sense. Okay, this is what you need to know, kind of the buzzwords for your MCQ. Acute angle closure glaucoma, as you can imagine, if that drainage angle shuts, if your sink gets completely blocked because I put the plug in, the sink is very quickly going to overflow and very quickly the water's going to come out, except here there's nowhere for this aqueous to go. So the pressure gets very, very, very high, very quickly. So the pressure goes very high, normal pressure is uh, 12 to 20 roughly. So you can see the pressure is almost double the upper limit. You get a red eye, you get a cloudy cornea where everything becomes cloudy. You can imagine if you've got loads of pressure building up, this cornea is gonna become very cloudy. Um, pain, just because of that pressure. And you get a fixed oval irregularly dilated pupil. And we'll talk about why, but basically that's because of all this kind of iris. So what happened is basically over time, because this iris is pulled outward so much, it starts to stick here and actually stick to the cornea at the edges and stick so much to the point that it just can't move backwards. So you get this kind of dilated pupil, which because it's stuck over here, it's not going to be able to kind of constrict back down. Yeah, watering eye reduced vision. So the ones in red are the kind of big kind of giveaway signs of acute angle closure, cloudy cornea, fixed oval, irregularly dilated pupil, and lots and lots of pain. Okay. So what do you actually do when you, this patient kind of comes into eye casualty and what do you need to know about um, for your MCQs? So immediately you need to bring that pressure down. A pressure of 40, 50 is really, really high. 
and you want to get it down really quickly because the longer that pressure stays up, the more damage there is to the optic nerve. If you remember, I said at the start, glaucoma means optic nerve damage to the ray, due to raised pressure. So if you've got pressure of 40, 50, 60, what happened is the eyeball is just an eyeball, but it sits in this orbit. Remember we talked about that in blowout fracture, the eyeball sits in the orbit, which is all the bones, the maxillary bone and things like that. So it can't really expand, it's, it's, it's stuck within that kind of bony orbit. But where will that pressure goes is it goes backwards onto the optic nerve. And very quickly, a higher pressure in the 40s, 50s, 60s can cause irreversible damage to the optic nerve. So that's why the nerve is involved in glaucoma, because that's where all that pressure gets kind of uh, enforced. And basically, that's closed angle glaucoma. Open angle glaucoma will come on to it, basically, is where your pressure is slightly higher. So rather than 20, it's 23, 24, 25, which is not bad at all but it's just not picked up for 10, 20 years. And that slightly higher pressure than normal causes very slow damage to the nerve. So that's basically the difference of how they work. Okay, sorry, where were we? So in acute angle closure glaucoma, when the pressure is very high, you've got to get that pressure down low to release all the pressure on the nerve because you don't want irreversible damage to the nerve. And you do that with um, drops, but more importantly, um, systemic things. So use your IV or oral diamox, or we call it cetazolamide. Um, and then the definitive treatment is to do what we call a laser peripheral iridotomy. So you don't need to know too much about that, but if you can see here, can you see there's a hole? There's actually the pupil and then there's another hole here. And that's actually, I did about six of these today. This is kind of a hole that we've manually made with laser. And you can imagine how it works. So what we do is we actually make a hole through this iris. So it's peripheral because it's on the edge right at the edge, it's laser, because we use laser, and iridotomy, otomy means hole, irid means iris. So we make a hole here, because if we've gone through here, then there's no way, or it really reduces the risk of all this posterior bowing. Can you remember here, the build, build up of aqueous in the posterior chamber pushes this forward even more. Whereas if you've got kind of an extra drainage channel here, some of the aqueous can kind of just bypass all of this and go straight through. So you don't usually get that mechanism. And we actually normally do it bilaterally because if you've got angle closure in one eye, you're probably at high risk because you've naturally got small eyes. So we just protect the other eye at the same time. So yeah, that's a treatment. Okay, any questions about that? Okay, sorry, was it older or younger individuals that are more susceptible? Older people are usually more susceptible for angle closure. Um, the reason why, um, I don't know if you want to know, um, it's kind of not necessary, but I think it's interesting. Basically, the reason why is, okay, this is a good picture to show. Um, you've got a lens here that sits naturally, remember? As you get older, you get something called a cataract, which you've probably all kind of heard of or start to hear of now. That's basically where this lens becomes cloudy because the waste products and toxic stuff just can't be kind of gotten rid of. And it basically gets thicker, 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 very dense, and obviously, the light can't go through, so we remove the cataract and people can see again, etc. That's what everyone thinks one used to. As that lens gets denser, it also gets thicker. So it starts to basically get thicker forward and thicker posteriorly. And you can imagine if that keeps pushing forward, it's narrowing this space even more because it's going to start by pushing this forward and then therefore it's going to push this part forward onto there. So that's why age causes, is a slight risk factor for acute angle closure glaucoma. Okay, Bridget says, if left untreated, could high enough pressure in acute angle closure glaucoma ever rupture a globe? Um, well, probably not because high pressure is so painful. Like, it's so, so painful. Like, the pandemic is a great example. Lots of people didn't want to come to hospital because of COVID. And then we still see someone come in, like, I had pressure in my eye for like a week. And now it's affecting my other eye. I just cannot live. And they were in bilateral angle closure, even though that never usually normally happens because people just cannot bear that pain. But yeah, it wouldn't ever rupture a globe. Could it rupture a globe? I guess technically, yeah. I guess technically the pressure could be so much that the cornea perforates, but yeah, um, globe rupture is almost always from trauma. Sorry, could you repeat why it's done bilaterally? The reason why it's done bilaterally is, remember what I said at the start, which is these people naturally have narrow angles. So therefore, if one angle has managed to close shut at one stage, then we want to treat that eye but there's a high probability or there is a high chance that that un is also narrow 
And therefore, at one day, the next day, or in a month, or a year, in five years, the same thing could happen. So rather than them go through all of that, we just make another little hole here, and it's kind of like a prophylactic peripheral endotomy on the other side. So it's really important to do it on both sides. Okay, does that make sense? Cool. Um, let's quickly, okay, go on to here. So primary open angle glaucoma, it's, it's the same thing, the pressure is up, but very, very minimally compared to angle closure acutely. And what is the mechanism? Basically the outflow of aqueous through these holes over here, which is called the trabecular meshwork channels, is basically reduced because these trabecular meshwork channels just get blocked up by things like debris and things like that. So if you stop little holes like this and they start to get blocked up, think of like your blood vessels and atherosclerosis, kind of like that. As you get older, you get them blocking up and slowly you've got, gone from a hole which is this big to something like something slightly smaller, but very, very minimally. They never get closed completely. But that kind of small blockage over many, many years is enough for the pressure to go slightly above normal. And once again, risk factors age. If you're older, then you're going to get more buildup. Um, if you're African, there's supposedly lots of Afro-Caribbean people get kind of open angle glaucoma. Family history is a strong one. So if you've got someone in your family who's got glaucoma open angle, you're more likely to have it yourself. Myopia. So this is the opposite to before. Remember we said hypermetropes, uh, which are people with small eyes get closed angle. Just remember the opposite. So with open angle, it's more the myopic patients. And then the diabetic patients as well. And the reason that people think diabetic patients are more likely to get open angle glaucoma. If you remember, I said the, the, the glaucoma itself is because that slightly high pressure affects the nerve. And what they say is with diabetics, their blood supply is just a bit rubbish because they've got all this thick, thick blood with lots of glucose and sugar. So if the nerve is already getting about 60% blood supply because of diabetes, and then they've got a little bit of blockage in these holes over here, they're just more at risk of getting open angle glaucoma. So that's the mechanism. Steroid drops, that's just a side effect of steroid. It pushes the pressure up. Okay, so primary open angle glaucoma, really important. Patients don't know they've got it. They have no idea that their pressure is 24 rather than 21. And that's the same with blood pressure. You don't know if your blood pressure is 130 or 120. You wouldn't get a heart attack. You would still be able to go upstairs fine. You'd be absolutely fine. Because the pressure is just a little bit above normal. But I say they have that for many, many, many years until they're 60, 70, 80, then they'd start to see some damage to the optic nerve. They still wouldn't feel anything, but the optician might be like, wait, your vision's quite bad actually in the periphery and your nerve looks a bit damaged. So what are the signs is an optic nerve cup to disc ratio of no more than 0.4. So if you look at the optic nerve, what we do is we call the cup that in a yellow circle. So that's the cup and this is the disc. So if that vertical ratio is more than 0.4, that's a sign that this may be a glaucoma affecting nerve. And the other thing is they lose their peripheral vision first. So you can imagine if the pressure is coming on the nerve, it starts to affect the outer nerve fibers first. So they lose the peripheral vision, but no one notices that. So if I can't see here, I'm not gonna notice that if, I could, if that until many, many years until, well, I can't see something right here. So that's why it's called like the silent eye disease. How do we treat open angle glaucoma? Once it's picked up, we kind of just need to bring that pressure down to a bit more normal. So we can start with kind of usually quite low intense drops. So once a day, once at night. And if it's still not working, then we can do things like laser or surgery. And the surgery is called trabeculectomy, which um, you don't need to know about. You don't need to know about that if you're doing the dual cover. So um, yeah, that's just a kind of extra mechanism to reduce the pressure. Oh, okay, that's pretty heavy. That's glaucoma. Um, over time okay got a little bit of time cool last two cases sorry guys i'm running a bit over 32 year old man presents to a &E with a six hour history of sudden onset flashing lights and a curtain in his sorry in his peripheral vision in the right eye so this is the vision suddenly they see this this is what we call like the typical curtain coming over he hears his head following a fall down the stairs two days prior and what is the diagnosis you would most worry about i want you most of you to get this um, what do you guys think? Let me put a poll up. I want you to narrow it down to at least two. So you've got A, vitreous detachment, B, retinal detachment, C, endophthalmitis, D, giant cell arteritis, and E, sorry, cataract. Go back to the question. 32 year old, six hour history of flashing lights, a curtain in the periphery of the right vision, 
and he was also had some trauma where he fell down the stairs two days ago. Okay, so we'll stop there. And most of you have gone for B, a rational detachment, and a few of you have gone for A, a detachment. I'm so glad that most of you have gone for those two because that's exactly what I want to show you. Endophthalmitis we'll cover in the next case, so you don't need to worry about that. Giant cell arthritis, we've talked about elderly patient, Caucasian, temple pain, jaw claudication, scalp tenderness, polymyalgia, so upper shoulder pain, um, reduced vision, um, and cataract is a very slowly progressive, we talked about slowly progressive kind of lens blurring, so no pain, just reduced vision, no curtain. Okay, so what is going on? The answer is a retinal detachment, but why? What is a retinal detachment? It's basically where um, the space between the neuroretina and the retinal pigment epithelium becomes separated. So just think the retina basically splits and pulls forward. You can see here, this is a retinal detachment, okay? Um, and it's an ophthalmology emergency. Risk factors, if you've got trauma, so you've got any kind of trauma punch to the eye, that's a big risk factor. If you've got retinal detachment in the other eye, you're more likely to have it here. Same thing with glaucoma, eyes that detach in one eye are more likely to attach in the other eye. And if you're a high myope, so like me, lots of you would be myopic, what that means is we've got bigger eyes. So if you imagine you've got a big eye, the, the tissues are just being stretched. And if they're being stretched, they're more likely to rip open and detach. Okay, so this is a picture of retinal detachment. You can see here, it's all starting to fibrose and scar, um, whereas this is all normal retina. How do you kind of, how would they present? Flashing lights is a big one and lots of new floaters. Um, so the big sign is the curtain over the vision. So what I'm gonna say is flashing lights makes you think restful detachment. Shadow or curtain of the vision makes you think restful detachment. Floaters alone are more vitreous detachment, okay? So what a vitreous detachment is, is if I can go back. The vitreous is the big jelly in this segment of the eye and it's just floating around. And like I said at the start, it doesn't do anything in our kind of adult life. It's just there. And a vitreous detachment happens to almost all of us at one stage. And basically what happens is the jelly is just moving around, moving around, moving around. This is the retina, this is the jelly. And at one point it just pulls a little bit away from the retina. And that's what's called a vitreous detachment. And it doesn't need to, you don't need to do anything. Um, if you're myopic, I don't know if any of you are here, most of you probably are, you normally see floaters. So if you look against a white background, you'll see kind of small black dots or black spiders. People that don't see them think we're absolutely mad, but you will see them. You'll see like all these black things flying around. I see them right now. And those are floaters. And that's just bits of the vitreous moving. So if the patient, if the question says just floaters, then you're more likely thinking it's a vitreous detachment where the vitreous has just moved forward and become agitated and then they start to settle. If you see flashing light, that's a sign that the retina has been irritated. If you see a shadow or curtain of the vision, that's almost a certain sign of a retinal detachment, okay? So that's why floats alone doesn't necessarily mean retinal detachment. You need one of, one, of, one of these at least, or maybe both of them. And the treatment is to refer to ophthalmology because they need urgent surgery. And the surgery we do is a pars plane of vitrectomy where we basically just remove the jelly and stick the retina back on. Okay, quick question. Are there people who don't see floaters? I don't know, does anyone here not see floaters? That's a, that's a question for the audience. Good, we could do a study here, 116 people who sees floaters and who doesn't. Um, okay, fine, cool. Um, let's on to the last case. 58 year old lady presents to a &E four days after routine right eye cataract surgery with an extremely red, painful right eye almost complete loss of vision in that eye. The vision is now not even 660. You can't even get onto the numbers. Even worse, it's count fingers. The eye is really red and there's a cloudy cornea with a hypopian. What is the most likely diagnosis, guys? Uh, should we get the poll up? Sorry, guys. What do you think the most likely diagnosis is here? Endophthalmitis, keratitis, acute anterior uveitis, anglocloidal glaucoma, or giant cell arthritis. Recent surgery, red painful eye, almost loss of vision, and a cloudy cornea with a hypopian. Last case of the day, guys. Should be finishing very soon. And 
going to stop there. Great, most of you have gone for the correct answer, which is endophthalmitis, great. So it just shows here that we've seen a hypopion before, but just because you see a hypopion doesn't mean it's the same as what we thought, which was a keratitis. Hypopion is white blood cells and pus that are sunk to the bottom. So that could be any big infection in the eye. What is the big giveaway that this is an endophthalmitis is the fact that they've had recent surgery. Anyone who's had recent surgery is much more like a kind of endophthalmitis. What does endophthalmitis mean? It's a very serious inflammation of the interior eye. So it basically means rather than a keratitis, which is just involving the cornea with the contact lens, endophthalmitis affects the inner part of the eye, the interior part of the eye. That's why if they've had surgery, they've actually been in the eye, they could have accidentally taken some bugs in with them. Um, so therefore, that's why surgery is a big kind of risk factor, especially the complicated surgery or they've got kind of bugs sitting there and on their eyelids and they've jumped in when you've had the surgery as well. So poor lid hygiene is another thing. What do they usually present with? Usually within the first few days or a week of surgery, really severe pain, big reduction in vision, like massive. And then all the kind of non-specific non signs, so red eye and the hypopia, which tells you it's infective. Once again, it's usually staphs, the bacteria that sits on kind of your hand, potentially if you don't scrub properly, gets on the instruments and therefore gets in the eye. And how do you treat it? You basically, the infections within the eye, which is really difficult to get to because the eye drops work on the surface. The IVs and orals work in and around the blood. To get in the eye, you need to put the antibiotics in the eye. So what we do is we take samples, kind of like how you take blood cultures. We take samples from the aqueous, so the front of the eye, the vitreous, which is the back jelly of the eye. And then within the vitreous, we inject loads of antibiotics that can circulate around and try and basically attack all those bugs. Okay, so that's a quick summary of all the kind of big cases. I'm just gonna add in kind of, this is the kind of big takeaway from this lecture. So of the cases that we saw, a bacterial keratitis, you wanna think contact lens wearer is a big risk factor. Um, endophthalmitis, recent surgery, very painful, very red eye. Orbital floor is most affected in a blowout fracture. The risk factors and angle closure glaucoma are female, very small eyes, which are called hypermetropic eyes. They're Asian and the older they get. And in orbital cellulitis, you want to image, if you want to image, the big imaging thing is CT. Last two things, just to remember that I haven't covered. Cataract, which we briefly talked about, is very, very gradual. So if you want to think, is this a cataract? Then you're thinking very progressive, very slow vision loss over many, many years. And one of the other symptoms is rather than just reduced vision, they sometimes say I have struggled driving at night because of the glare from flashlights. Um, and then anterior uveitis, which is an inflammation, um, is when they're photophobic. So remember, photophobia is very specific for anterior uveitis, but also it's associated with HLA-B27 diseases. So it's an autoimmune thing. So things like HLA-B27, can anyone remember? Give me three or a few anyway. HLA-B27 diseases, can anyone remember? Uh, angst bond, great. Uh, yeah, also to apply to sorry, to Besh, yeah, great. Uh, uh, yeah, perfect, you guys got it, yeah. So ankylosis spondylitis is the one that examiners love. So if you have HLA-B27, you're more likely to get anterior uveitis. So watch out for that question, which also is a young man with back pain. Okay, so that's basically a quick summary of some ophthalmology cases that could come up in your finals. I hope you guys found it useful. Um, I did a lot of talking, sorry that um, you had to hear my voice for a while, but hopefully it was kind of helpful. Um, I think I missed a few questions. Okay, I don't think so. Um, I'll pass over, I think, to Sid or the rest of the team. Um, and thanks for having me, guys. And if you do have any questions, then, yeah, let me know.